So when I say to them, courageous, what I think about is what happens to me when I walk in public with a purple shirt on. Uh, some people are glad to see me. Some people look at me like, oh, who are you? <laughs> you see, there is probably no point in the, his the recent history of the United States where we Christians stand in profound distinction to the life of our common life here in the United States. If there's anything that what this political season has taught us about our culture in both candidates is that character actually doesn't matter. What matters is policy, authority, and power. Even at the expense of honesty and integrity. If you can make it happen and say literally whatever you need to be able to say to get elected, then we'll vote for you. So we're in a very different place in making the decisions the, that we are making in terms of what we think is important in terms of our political life. It was not all that long ago that a question, questions around integrity and character actually would qualify or disqualify somebody from the electoral process. It wasn't all that long ago, you will remember, that there was a huge hue and cry calling for Bill Clinton's resignation because of his affair with Monica Lewinsky. Obviously, that conversation was not a part of this election season. So, more than ever, we're, as Christians, we're having to think about the fact that the things that we affirm, the things that we say, the things that we believe are, in fact, counter to the narrative in our culture. Counter, not neutral to, but actually counter to the narrative in our culture. Because we say things like, everyone is made in the image of God and therefore all people matter. No matter who they are. We say that it is the, it is the character of our King, Jesus. To care, in fact, especially for the weak, for the poor, for people who don't look like us in any way, shape, or form. That, in fact, before the sight of God, everyone matters. And that, in fact, we will give financially, as well as, as volunteers, to make sure that the people who are the most ignored in our culture are, in fact, the most deeply cared for. If you read this, what Paul, Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 12, the function of the body of Christ, he even goes so far as to say, and our weakest members receive the greatest honor. That's very different than might makes right. And therefore, you can say anything you want just so that the end justifies the means. You see, they're very distinctly different narratives, which asks of us a new kind of conversation and Bible study, deep Bible study, to think about what does it mean to be distinctly Christian in this culture right now, and how do we find a way to live that out together? How do we support one another so that we can find a way between each other to live out this common commitment to say that in the midst of all that is going on, we actually serve a different king who asks different things of us. And how do we find a way to be able to do that together? To celebrate Christ the King Sunday in any other context is about as delusional as what some people think about what we believe. Because to celebrate the king and call Jesus the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords means that all of us, as well as all of those who are in authority, are in fact subject to his judgments. 
rejoice in glorious hope, the Lord our God shall come. In other words, what we believe is the fact that we believe that we are accountable to God in a profoundly personal way, not merely as individuals, but as a society, as a culture, and even as a nation. So that we, when we, as a nation, make a decision to hold up values that are contrary to what's in here, then we are in fact liable when it comes time to face God as our judge. But there's more to it than that, and it's appropriately more to it than that. The more to it than that is that it's the very nature of this king to forgive. That's, that's in some ways the surprise. If you go through the narratives, you start with Jeremiah, and the first Jeremiah is, woe to the shepherds. Now, actually, who he really means are political leaders. Shepherd in that passage has not so much to do with religious leaders, although it includes them. But remember, he's, actually, he's really talking to politicians, <laughs> of which there can be those inside the church. Yes, nod your head. And so after his woes that are very specific, he promises to raise up something new. And the newness is that he, God, will come and be our shepherd and raise up one, and this is the name for this one whom he is raising up, is the Lord our righteousness. What that says, it causes me to go, oh, thank God, is, is that the Lord, the judge, the God of all creation, the maker of heaven and earth, the one who holds all of humanity in his hands, the very essence of who he is, is the one who imparts, who gives, and this is why forgiveness is so important, he gives us the capacity to be able to receive from him his goodness. The Lord, not just the Lord, the righteous one, but the Lord, our righteousness. In other words, he's doing something inside of us, claiming us and calling us as his own, as the one who is the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. You see, it is a mistake for Christians to think about our relationship with Jesus as my private affair that in fact has nothing to do with business or politics or the arts or culture or church life. That's exactly not worshiping Jesus as the king. See, if I have this sort of private little relationship with the God up there someplace who's helping me out when life gets difficult, but he actually isn't involved in human affairs, that's something that's very different from what the scripture teaches. What the scripture teaches is that nations are accountable to God. And that God is in fact calling all of us to come under his, as the prayer book says, most gracious rule. Jeremiah takes us to the Colossian reading. And the Colossian reading is filled with language that describes the greatness of his power. The fullness of who he is. And that Jesus isn't just some kind of, you know, wandering Palestinian rabbi. But he literally is God in the flesh in a way that makes him completely unique in all of the history of humanity. So we're kind of riding along this sort of this arc of exaltation, are we not? And then we get to the gospel reading. And where is Jesus in the gospel reading? Is he sitting on his throne? No, he's on a cross. As if to say to us, the height of kingly power, the deepest expression of what it means for Jesus to be the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords is not when he is exalted in glory, it is when he literally before his persecutors offers his dying prayer saying, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. It is that prayer and that all that he did in his, 
death and resurrection that makes the Lord our righteousness possible and calls us to a different kind of life where what we do in the face of oppression is both stand clearly for who we are and to stand beside those who are in fact being oppressed and at the same time, and this is the hard part, saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's the Christian distinction. You see, there are plenty who have been raised up in history who have stood behind and beside and fought on behalf of the oppressed. That's not unique to Christian tradition at all. But what is unique to Christian tradition is that not only we call to do that, and to do that with wisdom and courage, to be able to do that with all of the resources that are brought to us, so that St. Mary's is thinking about how can the kingship of Jesus be expressed here in Bellevue? And what does that look like? How do we care for people in need? How do we encourage people who are operating businesses to do so with life and integrity? How can we be a force for good in the midst of this society and where God has placed us? Because for, Jesus, for the kingship of Jesus, society out there really matters. But to be able to both do that and at the same time say to those and pray for those who literally are engineering systems of financial well-being to the expense of other people. That's what oppression is, you see. To say, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. And the fact of the matter is, is that they don't. C.S. Lewis put it this way. He said, if I knew everything that there was about a human being, meaning made in the image of God, I would look at them and I would be tempted to genuflect. That's encased in the baptismal language when it says, will you respect the dignity of every human being? You see, there's something irreplaceable and precious about each person in the sight of God, regardless of who they are. Regardless, you see, of who they are. And we've made a commitment before the Lord who treats us that way. Because we are precious in his sight. To offer that same kindness and generosity to other people. To walk together in a way that really looks like the kingdom of heaven. Where in heaven there is every tribe, tongue, language, people, and nation. It's not an in-group in any way, shape, or form. It literally represents the very cross-culture and the, of, of all of humanity. And so what all of that says is, he forgives us. He welcomes us. He calls us to serve him as our Lord. And to bring all of our life under his authority. Not to have a kind of private relationship with Jesus that has nothing to do with how I spend my money or how I vote or how I deal, work in my life and community. It all matters. It all matters profoundly because Jesus is the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. So now you can understand what I say to confirmants when I say, I think what you're doing is pretty courageous. Because it's actually a life orientation. The same for the Edwards family. They are here making unbelievably huge commitments. I mean, almost frighteningly so. About how they are going to raise up Xavier in the Christian life and faith. That means everything that I've just talked about. Teaching people how to value others, even when you disagree. People who are men and women of prayer who pray deeply, especially for your enemies or the people with whom you disagree. 
asking God to work in us the kind of compassion that takes us out of the kind of identity politics and tribalism that so marks our culture, where if you don't think the way I do, then you're the enemy. We say, no. God does not deal with us that way. <laughs> I think that we're going to be very surprised, myself included, when we finally get to heaven and we stand before Jesus as our King and Lord and we will say, oh, in some ways I was so wrong. It's a part of what it means to be human. As Paul says, we know in part. We prophesy in part. So we don't have it all, but we trust him to guide and lead us and to continue to change us and to work in us that kind of heart of love and care, that kind of freedom to be able to reach out to people, even if they're not like us. And to say that's really what God intends even for our society, not just for the church. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to see me. For as much as you have done it unto the least of these, my brothers, you have done it to me. People in politics would call that a pretty terrifying foreign policy. <laughs> but I want to say to you, our call is to model something different. So, sisters and brothers, ask God to bring your life together. Not religion here, politics here, social life there. But instead, ask God to integrate in you the depths of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And out of that, you know what will happen? There, were, there are people in Bellevue. There are people in the villages. There are people in Ocala who are looking and longing for a place where they can belong, where the cries of their heart for forgiveness and mercy can be answered, where they can be known and received, even if they don't look like anybody else in the room right now. Because membership is not based on culture. It's not based on race. It's not based on politics. It's based on we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and all that that is expressed in baptism. So family, as we're about to move into this baptism and this confirmation, we're coming down to the real basics of what it means, in fact, to say, I believe that Jesus is the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. And that he would work in us more deeply as a way of life Father, forgive them. Not, Father, I want to get even. <laughs> but, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Amen.